kind of like a fake shocking machine. Um, uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna answer some of the questions that you submitted earlier, um, and you can like shout your name in joy or something if I uh, use your question, or if you're like me, you can just you know stay quiet. <laughs> so, um, but I, I did I, I'm gonna answer the questions that were related to the Fallen Stars. The first one is: Is the title of the book the only Caesar-y thing about it, or are there some similar themes slash Shakespearean things about it? Um, so, the, all right. <laughs> So the title of the book comes uh, from the, the uh, famous moment in, in um, Julius Caesar when a Roman nobleman says to Brutus, the fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves, that we are underlings. Which is an easy thing to say if you're Shakespeare. Um, <laughs> or if you're a Roman nobleman. Um, but like the, the, the truth of the matter is that we all know that suffering is distributed unevenly in the world, and that some people suffer more than others, and that um, there often is fault in, in the stars. And um, it was another way of trying to invert the traditional epic, or the traditional subject matter of literature. Um, and so it was important to me that it be, you know, Julius Caesar, that it be Shakespeare. There are a few times when um, the novel kind of quotes Shakespeare and then takes him, takes him down a notch, um, which obviously does not is not meant to reflect that I don't think Shakespeare is a good writer. Um, I think that he is a good writer. <laughs> but but um, uh, a lot of times, a lot of times we buy we buy into sentiments that are 500 years old and, and not as relevant as they used to be. Like, for instance, uh, the sentiment um, in Shakespeare's Sonnet 55 that Peter Van Houten nails him on when he talks about how um, you know in, in, embalming someone in a rhyme gives them immortality. Well, you know, nothing gives you immortality. Uh, what'd you say? Four crosses. Four crosses. <laughs> I mean, actually, I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to get off on a tangent, particularly when I only have nine minutes and forty-three seconds left. But um, I mean, one of my central, one of my central issues with not only Harry Potter, which, I, which is obviously I loved, um, but all, also like most, um, most fantasy series, is that they imagine immortality as a possible thing in a way that like fails to confront the underlying reality that the sun will explode. Um, and it's really, it's really troubling to me, and, and, and more generally, it's really troubling to me that we have this inability to understand that our species is temporary, and that everything that we do will end. Um, and there will come a time when no one remembers that we did anything. Um, so if we're living our lives in pursuit of some idea of immortality, we are really doing ourselves a great disservice, but we're also doing a great disservice to the people who, who come after us, which is a, a big part of what The Fall in Our Stars is about. What was your favorite part of writing The Fall in Our Stars, asks Megan. Um, uh, it, was, it took a long time, so I guess there were a lot of favorite parts, but when I finished the first draft, um, I, I sent it to, to my editor, Julie Strauss-Gable, who's been my editor on all my books and is one of my dear friends and is here tonight. And I asked her to read it. <laughs> well, now she's going to think that she's famous. <laughs> we don't want that. Um, I, I remember I sent it to her and I was, I've never been more nervous in my entire life. And I probably called her a hundred times in the next 48 hours. Um, and she would say, I'm reading it. And I, I, I was like, well, she's like, I'm in the middle. <laughs> so I'm going to reserve judgment. And then she called me at the end and I was in, uh, like driving home with my wife and son from a family vacation. And um, I was in like a McDonald's drive through I remember. And she was like, you know, it's not very good, but um, it, it will be good, um, and, which is one of the nicest things that Julie's ever said. <laughs> so I remember being really, really happy, feeling like we, we finally had a book that, that could be a book someday. Um, the next question is, was Isaac's name intentional? Yes. Like Isaac? No. Um, <laughs>
my motives, you should not look to puns. Um, I should say that like what a writer thinks about his or her book is completely irrelevant because books belong to their readers, but you asked. So um, so I'll answer, but it, you know, it's not my book anymore. Um, but my answer is I named him after, you know, like Isaac, the original Isaac of, of the Bible. Um, <laughs> Who, who goes blind after nearly being killed by his father, but then saved by the same God who was going to kill him. Um, Isaac, that Isaac, not, not the pun. Although, it is definitely a, a pun. <laughs> um, you write about uh, wanting to do something that leaves a mark on the world. How does that relate, if at all, to you and Hank making videos that will always be online? Um, that's a very interesting question to me because it's really, I, I love making YouTube videos and um, one of the things that I love about them is that they do become kind of a historical record in a weird way. Particularly, I mean, Hank and I have been making videos for more than five years now, so I can go back and see a much younger version of myself. I can see someone who had just published An Abundance of Catherines and um, was, you know, struggling to find a way to make a living as a writer and, and you know, struggling to figure out, I had just gotten married. And so, I, and that, that's very interesting. Um, but YouTube videos won't last forever, to go back to a, a previous theme, nothing does. Um, and, and so at the same time that they're a historical record, they're also sort of ephemeral, which is part of what appeals to me about YouTube as opposed to writing books. What I love about writing books is that I get to spend a long, long time making something for you, and I get to make exactly the thing that I want to make for you. Um, and I get to spend, if, it, if that takes three or five or 12 years, that's how long that it takes, and that's okay. What I like about YouTube is that if I don't make a video, when I'm supposed to make a video, I get punished. <laughs> um, and so that forces me into action. It forces me to continue the conversation uh, among us. And that's really important because otherwise there would be these huge years-long gaps in the conversation. Um, and it also forces me to you know, be in communication with my brother, which is very helpful. I think boys, like grown-up men, in order to be friends as, as siblings often need like a shared project. Um, and Brotherhood 2.0 has very much become that for us in our lives. It has become kind of, you know, a bind for, uh, for us because it is this, um, you know, thing that we have to do all the time. <laughs> Does the name Hazel have any significance? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, Again, that's up to you to decide, not up to me to decide, but I, I, since you asked. Um, yeah, I mean, I picked the name Hazel. In the part that I read, she talks about how she's always been univalent Hazel, how, how Hazel is not a name that lends itself to nicknames very well. And that was important to me, that she have a poly or mul you know, bisyllabic, whatever. Uh, a, name, a name with more than one syllable that doesn't have a lot of nicknames for it. Like some people say Hazy or Haze, but that's pretty uncommon. Most people just say Hazel. And then also, you know, Hazel is an in-between color, and Hazel in a lot of ways is in an in-between space. She was told that she should not expect to live very long and has lived longer than she expected. She's in this, um, and she's also in this space between, you know, being able to breathe and drowning. She's also in the space between adulthood and uh, childhood, and she's also in this weird um, kind of semi-permanent tension between being sick and well, because she can't recover. She can't, um, you know, she says at one point, I think my high school friends wanted to help me through my cancer, but they eventually realized that there was no through. Um, and when you realize that there is no through, you have to live in this uh, this weird in-between space in much the same way that, you know, hazel eyes are kind of in-between eyes. So that, that's why. I'm going to take a few questions from the people I can see, which are the people in like the first six rows. O over there in the first row. Sorry, people in the back. It's nothing personal. <laughs> I don't, I can't see them. <laughs> Oh, I said there was a typo in the author's note, but which there is. Thanks for mentioning it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I tweeted it. Uh, I, 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 I said neither or, when I should say neither nor. Um, it's been fixed. It's been fixed already. It's over. It's only a problem for your books. <laughs> All the books that are being printed today and yesterday, perfect. Uh, in the third row there. What's my favorite sentence in the novel? I mean, I don't, I have to tell you the truth, which is that I'm not a huge fan of my writing. <laughs> um, like, I don't have that sort of, 
I don't, I, did someone said I used too many words. Um, well, they're pretty short. I mean, maybe you should call Christopher Paolini. Um, oh, I, 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 I like those books, or I wouldn't have made that joke. Um, but they're long, that's all I'm saying. Um, geez, I, I, don't, I, I really don't have a favorite sentence. Um, uh, I mean, yeah, I guess like the last one. I like the last one. <laughs> But that would be a spoiler. That would be the biggest spoiler in the book, I think. Yes? Um, this is more of a question, but how much influence do you have on your digital audiobook characterizations like visual and documentation? Uh, the question is, how much influence do I have on the, on the audiobook's like, pronunciation and the characterization of Hazel? Um, that's a really interesting question. Uh, most of the time, authors have very little. I'm very fortunate that I have a really great relationship with my audiobook publisher, Brilliance Audio. And so they sent me the longest list you have ever seen of every word in the book. And they're like, how do you pronounce all this stuff? And I'm like, I don't have no idea. I'm a writer. <laughs> I just write the things down. I don't know how to say them. <laughs> Go to dictionary.com. Um, and then, but I, I did have a lot of say in choosing, helping choose the narrator, Kate Rudd, who I think sounded so much like Hazel to me, and also got the pace of her, of her talking right and the pace of pace of Gus's talking right, which was really important to me. Like, she's a believable, a believable Gus. Thank you. Um, thank you, person who does not want to see me shocked. You're the hero of the night. So, um, <laughs> uh, you'll see someone shocked later. I'm now going to bring back my brother Hank, and we're going to answer some questions together. It's a question